There's a lot to slip bobber fishing, more so than meets the eye. I think slip bobbering kind of evokes this thought of panfish when you're younger, you're just starting out. But when it comes to being used as a walleye technique, there's so much to it. And I'm just gonna cover a couple of the finer points of why I do what I do and when I choose to do those things. And I think first off is when it comes to cork and when to cork, I think one reason to cork is especially early season if walleyes are a little bit finicky, a little bit slow, anytime they're a little bit sluggish, it's really nice to dangle bait in their face, live bait of really any type. Uh, another time to cork is definitely, you've heard of the power corking. If you've got pods of fish scattered in different places, literally mark them with the side imaging or on your sonar, pitch over to them, drop bait in their face, see if they eat, if they don't, literally reel up and get it to another fish. It's a high percentage efficient way to go after multiple pods of fish as you see them on the graph. You know it's being dangled right in their face. You know they should eat it if they're active. But when it comes to the system itself, there's also a lot to that. You see this rod is pretty exceptionally long. I mean, really, when you're talking about slip bobbering, you're talking about rods that are in excess of seven feet this is actually an eight foot six inch rod. I think it's about the right length for me. Uh, it's a medium light power, it's an extra fast action. I don't think that matters as much. The length is really the key to me, having a good solid backbone. And the big reason is, is when you have that bobber down, sometimes this thing is over 20 feet of water, sometimes 25 or more feet of water. If you're away from your float at all, not only do you have to take the slack out from that angle from you to the top of the bobber, you need to take the slack out and cover that angle from what's going on from the bobber down to the bottom where the fish is hooked on. So literally having a rod that's long helps you provide a long sweeping hook set that takes a lot of line up really fast. When it comes to line, uh, a good low stretch mono is great. Some guys will run braid all the way up to maybe a swivel. Uh, I think a good reason to run braid is that it's low stretch, right? That's a good thing about it. Uh, one of the bad things is that sometimes slip knots, uh, bobber stops don't work as well on certain kinds of braids. So just experiment, find out what works best for you. This is the Suffix Advance, so it doesn't stretch very much. I feel like it's a really good line for it. All right, bobber stops. You'll see here, I've got a bobber stop and I've got all of that curly, twisty line hanging out and people all the time say, you know, why do you do that? Um, mostly because, you know, I do it, not all the time, but I, when I do it, it's because I like that for visibility, that extra tag end, all of that extra hanging off, blue, orange, yellow, whatever you're using, is really gonna help you see your stop as it's working its way out to the end of the float and going down. Now that's key in a lot of, in a lot of instances because sometimes Wallace will actually come up and eat it and they'll grab it <laughs> before the bobber stop even gets to the bobber if it's a really aggressive bite. Sometimes when that bobber stops, that's when, when you, you, know, you decide to go ahead and reel up and set the hook. Uh, it does limit your casting distance. So if it's the kind of slip bobber bite where you really feel you need to stay off of the fish in shallow, clear water and you need to really get distance, that's when I'll clip those tag ends of that, of that bobber knot all the way down to the line. So those are the two reasons I would run it long or I would clip it down. You choose depending on the situation you're in. So the moment of truth comes when you actually have to set and figure out what depth to put your whole slip system at. And that can be challenging because depending on what the fish are showing you on the graph and on the screen, you might choose to do things a little bit differently. If fish are active off of bottom a little ways, uh, it's, it's a prime scenario in some respects, but you need to be careful to stay above them. Those walleyes will love to come up and feed, especially if they're already, you're seeing them on the graph scattered above bottom. In that scenario, I'll set it two or three feet above bottom quite often. It's a really common scenario, um, especially if I'm using something that's slow falling, like a plain hook sy system like you see here. But if I'm using a jig on the end of this, and I'm trying to figure out exactly where to set my float. If I'm seeing those fish on the bottom, I need to make sure to be within six inches, maybe a foot of bottom. So that's where a depth bomb can come in handy to basically set things right next to the side of the boat. But it becomes a little tricky if you're fishing a shoreline break situation where depths will vary depending on your cast. So that's where it pays to do a little bit of experimenting. 
a good slip bobber angler, I feel, is always, always double checking and kind of adjusting where their slip knot is going, right? And trying to figure out exactly where is bottom. And you'll know that if your bobber lays on its side and you don't see that knot with all this fray coming and making it stand up, you'll know that your weight is sitting on bottom. That way you'll know you'll have to set it just a little bit shorter to make sure that when you make a shallow cast like that, you're actually gonna float that bait up and above the fish. So that's maybe the number one problem that I see with a lot of people running slip floats is so often they're so concerned about being on the bottom, they can be too close to the bottom. So make sure to set it off just a little bit to let those walleyes have some room to come up and eat them. And I think that's a tip that's gonna help you catch more fish slip bobber. So a little bit more about the componentry on the business end of the rig. Um, you can choose your leader length here based on the amount of fall and, and how slow you want it to fall really. The problem is, is what you, once you get much longer than this, this is maybe two feet, once you get much longer than this, uh, you run the risk of snagging your hook or your bait up and around this sinker and this swivel. Uh, for that reason, I actually like running fluorocarbon, maybe a 10 pound test, um, for no other reason than it's a little bit stiffer and it actually stays stiff and away from the main line quite a bit when you're casting. I just tend to have less follow-ups that way. So um, not, not necessary, but if you're gonna get really technical, sometimes a little bit stiffer line will keep that bait from falling up against. If you don't have any, no problem. This is just 10 pound uh, suffix advanced. You can use the same stuff that you're using for your main line. Again, here I have a swivel as a way to connect the two together. Hooks and hook size, I think your standard live bait hook size for walleyes, uh, four or six, somewhere in that range is gonna be about perfect for what you're trying to do for live bait. The same hooks that you would use for lindy rigging and so on and so forth work just fine if you're using a plain hook setup. Again, if you're using a jig, somewhere in that quarter ounce or less range, maybe eighth ounce, even 16th ounce if you're shallow enough. Um, but you wanna avoid when you're in a power corking situation out deep, to be waiting too long for that whole thing to slip down. So just make sure you choose a size that's appropriate for the depths that you're gonna be fishing. You'll see I've got a bead here, got a standard slip float. Make sure the slip float is big enough to support some extra weight, and here's why. I will run two systems on the business end of this. I'll either run a leader with a plain hook and a weight above a swivel right here. The weight helps that whole unit get down, stand my bobber up, gets to the fish quickly. This is actually a, an eighth ounce slip sinker. I've run up to a quarter ounce slip sinker with bigger bobbers. Now the reason I'd run a plain hook and maybe a leech, a crawler, a minnow, is when I want that bait to fall enticingly slowly. I want the whole thing via the slip sinker to get down quickly, but when I want that bait to fall ever so slightly into a walleye's face, that's when I'll use a plain hook scenario. When the bite is on or things are going pretty well, fish are fairly aggressive, you don't need that amount of enticement. I run, instead of a slip sinker here, I'll get rid of that slip sinker further up. I'll just run direct tie to a jig of varying weights. Maybe if I'm using an eighth ounce slip sinker, I'll use an eighth ounce jig or a quarter ounce jig, somewhere in that territory. So if walleyes are finicky, the slow fall rate is awesome on a plain hook. If it doesn't matter and fish are pretty aggressive and you're power corking, you're trying to get through a lot of fish quickly, just run a straight jig head. So you've gotten everything that you need to do some slip bobber. You've got the long rod, you've got the reel, line, all the rigging components, and you're ready to go out and fish. And there's kind of two main camps um, in slip bobbering in terms of how you fish it and how fast to fish it. The first is kind of that power corking variety where guys are really actively looking for fish on their graph, casting to them, giving them maybe 30 seconds, a minute, no more than that by any means, as long as you dangle it in their face, uh, and then moving on to the next fish. And then there's other guys that, that still do kind of believe uh, more in terms of finding a good structural element, something that fish will work their way up to, a good rock pile, a good reef, sunken island, so on and so forth. Cast their bait up to a likely location, um, still maybe check out parts of that structure, but allow more of the fish to come to them than they go to the fish. So depending on which school of thought you choose to believe in or do more with, uh, either way, what I want you to do is to go ahead, get what you need, make a cast. And after you make your cast, let that bobber settle out, right? Let, let everything get vertical and give the fish a little bit of time to come to it. But you'll be surprised the more you slip bobber, the more you fish for walleyes, it's a pretty, I won't say instantaneous reaction, 
but once they see that bait, they usually either choose to close within, you know, 15, 20 seconds or they don't. So typically I'm moving around 20 to 30 seconds, uh, at, at least, you know, reeling up a little bit, bringing it a little bit closer, letting it settle out again, choosing to cover water. That's the way I like to fish when I'm slip bobbering. I think it puts more bait in front of more fish's mouths. And I think if you go ahead and check out all these components, get yourself some of the right equipment, some of the right tools for the job, get the full setup and take some of these tips to heart. I think it'll really help you catch more fish and maybe even make slip bobbering a favorite technique for you.